There's a linen cloth stored in a temperature-controlled case in Turin, Italy. It looks ordinary, aged, yellowed by time, faintly marked by centuries of handling. But when you look closer, it holds an image. Faint, ghostly, almost hidden in the fibers, a front and back imprint of a human body. The face is serene, the hands crossed and the wounds unmistakable. This is the Shroud of Turin, an object so deeply mysterious, so historically loaded and so scientifically frustrating that it has confounded experts for decades. It has been called a medieval hoax, a divine relic, a photographic anomaly, and even a quantum event. Its very existence forces us to ask, how do we define authenticity? What qualifies as evidence? And can something be both a scientific enigma and a spiritual icon at the same time? To begin understanding this relic, we have to go back, not just to the medieval period, but to the very edges of recorded history. The shroud didn't appear in any verifiable historical records until the 1350s in the small French town of Lurie. A local knight, Gaufroy de Charny, presented it as the burial cloth of Jesus Christ. He claimed it had been passed down through his family, though no earlier documentation of its existence has ever been confirmed. From the moment it was displayed, the controversy ignited. Pilgrims flocked to see it. The church was hesitant. Some officials embraced it, others denounced it as a fraud. One bishop, Pierre d'Arcis, wrote a detailed memorandum to the Pope arguing that the shroud was a fake and even claimed to know the artist who had created it. But strangely, no name was ever revealed, and the Pope never officially condemned it. Over the centuries, the cloth traveled. It was moved, hidden, saved from fire, and eventually ended up in Turin, where it's been kept and venerated for over 400 years. It's now stored in a climate-controlled case, displayed only on rare occasions, and has become the most studied religious relic in the world. But for all its mystique, one detail has always defied explanation, how the image was formed. When Secondo Pia set up his bulky camera in the Cathedral of Turin in 1898, he couldn't have known he was about to make one of the most controversial discoveries in religious history. He was a lawyer by profession, not a scientist, and photography was still in its experimental adolescence. Yet, as he developed the glass plate negatives in his darkroom, something utterly unexpected emerged from the chemical bath. The face of a man, vivid and hauntingly lifelike, staring back at him. What Pia saw wasn't the original faint imprint visible on the cloth. It was the inverse of that. The light and dark tones had flipped, revealing detailed anatomy. Swollen cheeks, closed eyes, a bloodied forehead, and a mouth slightly open as if frozen in breathless stillness. The negative image had become more detailed than the original. The shroud, it seemed, wasn't an image in the traditional sense, it was already a negative. And this changes everything. In traditional artwork, an image is constructed deliberately, light and shadow shaped by pigment, perspective and intent. But the shroud defies this principle. The light areas on the cloth represent parts of the body that were closer to the linen, while darker tones reflect parts further away. This spatial relationship, capturing depth based on distance, is the foundation of modern 3D imaging. Keep in mind, this is a cloth from at least the 14th century, if not far older. The idea of embedding depth-based visual information into a two-dimensional fabric using shading that only reveals its full detail in photographic negative form, that's not just ahead of its time, it's completely out of time. More remarkably, the image doesn't show signs of brushwork, contour outlines, or any technique used by artists of the medieval era. There are no pigments, no binders. The coloration is confined to the uppermost fibrils of the cloth, less than the width of a human hair. This isn't paint, it's not dye. It's a dehydration and oxidation of cellulose fibers. The kind of effect you'd get from a short, intense burst of energy. But how and from where? The photographic negative revelation turned the shroud from a historical curiosity into a global scientific puzzle. Now, it wasn't just theologians and historians who were interested. Physicists, chemists, forensic experts, and image analysts joined the fray, drawn in by one impossible question. How could a medieval cloth encode a photographic and topographical negative hundreds of years before photography existed? Was it an unintentional chemical phenomenon? A now lost artistic process or something much stranger? And this was only the beginning. The more the image was studied, the more anomalous it became. 
paving the way for one of the most debated scientific investigations of the 20th century. In 1988, the world paused to witness what many thought would be the final chapter in the Shroud's story. After years of pressure from the scientific community, the Vatican approved a limited radiocarbon dating test with a strict condition, only a tiny piece, no more than a few square centimeters, would be cut from the cloth. The chosen section was located at the edge, a spot deemed the least visually significant and, at the time, believed to be representative of the whole. Three labs, Oxford, Zurich, and the University of Arizona, ran independent tests using accelerator mass spectrometry, one of the most precise dating techniques available. The verdict came quickly and with confidence, the cloth dated between 1260 and 1390 AD. In the eyes of many scientists, that was game over. A medieval artifact, nothing more. But even as headlines around the world declared the shroud a hoax, cracks in the conclusion began to appear almost immediately. Textile experts, particularly those familiar with ancient weaving techniques, pointed out that the tested section wasn't consistent with the rest of the cloth. It featured an unusual herringbone weave with signs of reweaving, subtle but visible differences in fiber twist, dye absorption, and even the presence of cotton, a material not found elsewhere on the linen. Researchers like Ray Rogers, a chemist from Los Alamos National Laboratory and a member of the original Shroud of Turin research project, were skeptical. Rogers, initially supportive of the radiocarbon results, acquired threads from the same corner tested in 1988 and examined them under a microscope. What he found changed his mind. Evidence of modern dyes and spliced fibers, proof that the sample had been contaminated by medieval repairs, likely after fire damage centuries earlier. And this contamination wasn't trivial. It introduced newer material into the very area that that was radiocarbon dated, skewing the age. If the test measured threads that were repaired during the 13th or 14th century, then the result didn't reflect the age of the original linen at all. Critics also highlighted procedural problems. Only one area was sampled. The testing was done without full transparency, observers were limited, and the labs worked in isolation. In scientific terms, it was a single sample, non-replicated, non-randomized test on a heavily handled artifact. That's not a solid foundation for closing a centuries-old mystery. So while the 1988 test delivered a clear number, it may have answered the wrong question. It didn't prove when the shroud was made, it dated when a patched section of it was added. And in doing so, it opened the door not to resolution, but to renewed curiosity. The idea that a medieval repair fooled modern science is not just possible, it's increasingly accepted among researchers familiar with ancient textiles. But if the shroud's true age wasn't revealed by radiocarbon dating, what might? And more importantly, if the shroud wasn't created in the Middle Ages, when was it? When modern science hit a wall, technology opened a new door. For decades, every kind of analysis imaginable had been applied to the shroud. Chemical testing, x-rays, photogrammetry, but the puzzle remained unsolved. That's when a new tool entered the scene, artificial intelligence. And unlike human observers, AI doesn't rely on perception. It finds structure where we see randomness. It finds relationships where we see noise. One of the most intriguing breakthroughs came from deep learning algorithms trained on visual pattern recognition. These models were fed ultra-high resolution images of the shroud and instructed not to identify the image itself, but to search for statistical anomalies, symmetries, and spatial dependencies across the fibers. The AI didn't care about theology, art history, or medieval forgery theories. It simply read data. And what it found stunned researchers. The image wasn't just randomly distributed discoloration. It exhibited consistent axial symmetry, subtle mathematical scaling, and gradient variations that suggested the image had been formed under a uniform directional influence, something like radiation or controlled energy diffusion. These patterns were not uniform like ink or paint. They were fractal-like, growing more complex the deeper you zoomed in. The shading on the face and body wasn't just visually realistic, it followed measurable rules of light dispersion and distance decay, mimicking how light would naturally diminish over space, despite the lack of any known light source in its formation. But here's where it gets even more unusual. 
Using convolutional neural networks CNNs, the same architecture used in facial recognition software, AI systems detected subdermal structures faintly encoded in the cloth's image. Some researchers even claim to have detected hints of teeth beneath the lips and bone outlines in the hands. These weren't visible to the naked eye, or even in photographic negatives. Only when the image was broken down to data, pixel by pixel, did these anatomical suggestions emerge. That's not something any paintbrush, or even a photographic process, could accidentally replicate. More fascinating still, the AI identified a nonlinear intensity pattern across the entire cloth. Meaning the image wasn't created by something simply pressing onto the fabric. Instead, the data pointed toward a process where the intensity of the image diminished with depth, suggesting a three-dimensional event that radiated out from a point source, as if the body itself emitted the image in a controlled, decaying burst. At this point, science doesn't have a name for such a process. But AI is uncovering the mathematical fingerprints of something far more advanced than medieval craftsmanship. Something that bridges physics, image science, and perhaps, just perhaps, an unknown frontier of energy and matter. And it begs a deeper question. If the image was truly formed in an instant, by some kind of high-energy event, what kind of event could leave behind this level of detail, and only on the outermost fibers of linen, without scorching the cloth beneath. The shroud exists in a strange space, a relic that's neither proven authentic, nor convincingly debunked. It's too detailed to dismiss, too enigmatic to explain. To believers, it may represent the literal moment of resurrection, a flash of divine energy captured in cloth. To skeptics, it's an unexplained, but ultimately human-made artifact. To scientists, it's a problem that resists solving. A challenge to the laws of image formation, a relic that has refused to give up its secrets, even under the scrutiny of nuclear analysis, forensic reconstruction, and now, artificial intelligence. Maybe that's why it endures. Because whether you see it as proof of Christ's resurrection, a medieval mystery, or a forgotten technology, we all see the same thing. The face of a man who suffered, imprinted into cloth, looking back across 2,000 years, daring us to understand. And maybe, daring us to believe. If this video left you with more questions than answers, you're not alone. And that's exactly why the Shroud of Turin continues to captivate people across every faith, discipline, and belief system. So if you found this story fascinating, hit that like button, subscribe for more deep dives into the places where science and history collide, and check out the links in the description for further reading, source documents, and behind-the-scenes AI breakdowns. Until next time, stay curious, keep questioning, and never stop searching.